God's word tells us that the God of this world, Satan, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of human beings so that they cannot understand the truth. Okay? So, when it comes to Bible study, unless they're being drawn by the Holy Spirit, there is not really a lot of interest there. And even people who are in Christ who don't study the Bible, there's, I'm not saying that they're demon-possessed, I'm not saying there's, a, a, there's an oppression on them, but the God of this world has blinded their eyes so they cannot see the truth. And we know this, that the Lord tells us that you will know the what? The truth, and the truth will set you free. And so Jesus said, I am the way, the and the, and no man comes to the Father but by him. And so he's the one doing the drawing of these 2.3 billion people are, who are in Christ, but the Lord is still drawing people unto him. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by and now we know this from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. The word was with God. Okay. We know that the word is Jesus. So when we study the word, we are studying Jesus, the spirit of Christ. We are studying the word. So the God of this world has blinded our eyes. Now some of you, maybe this is the first time you've done an in-depth study. You will have done an in-depth study. Some of you will have struggles going through it all summer. Now, everybody's going to have vacation. I'm going to go on vacation this summer. Hallelujah. Who's going on vacation this summer? Hallelujah. But when we get back, we're back in it. Okay? We're back in it. Some of you will have struggles sticking through it. Ask yourself this question. Why? Some of you have never finished a study you started. Why? Was it boring? Maybe. Was it not important? Wrong. A lack of discipline? I, I think that uh, you're, you're probably 100% correct on lack of discipline, and I think the other thing that goes with lack of discipline is this. To find something better to do. Okay? And think of this, that I believe that the God of this world actually even causes blindness to come upon the believers so that they will not discover the truth because once you are a believer in Christ and you begin to discover and saturate yourself with the truth you will know the truth and the truth will set you free and you will have full freedom in your life full freedom now there are five reasons, according to King Solomon, that we study the Proverbs. As we work into these five reasons, I want you to write down something on your notes, and it's called Hamurabi. Hamurabi. How do you spell that? I don't know. Just hooked on phonics. Hamurabi. Write that down. Hamurabi. And you say, why are we learning about Hamurabi? In case you don't know this, Solomon did go to school himself. And he learned the wisdom of a guy named Hammurabi. We understand this because Hammurabi wrote Proverbs himself. And so the Lord allowed Solomon to sit under Hammurabi and to gather knowledge of the Proverbs and the importance of it. And then the Proverbs that Solomon wrote that we have that we're studying, much of it is based upon stuff that he learned when he was in school. Yes, we know that God gave him wisdom when he, asked, when he said, uh, what do you want, Solomon? And Solomon said, just give me wisdom to lead. And said, God, I'll, uh, I'll make you the wisest guy there. And he had enough wisdom to, to gather things around. So you might see, sometimes you see Proverbs written in other languages and other cultures, and it's even close to the Proverbs that we study. And they, they are because the word of God kind of floats. God's word is true, even if it's in a culture that doesn't believe in God. Can you understand that? God's word is true even with people who don't believe in God. So let's go and we're going to dig out the, these five things. And the first one is, first reason for attaining revelation. Now revelation is what we call aha moments. Aha moments. For revelation, impartations of spiritual understanding. The last one is spiritual understanding. So revelation and the impartation of spiritual understanding. So revelation is an aha moment. All right, all of us here in Christ have had an aha moment. If you haven't, you will. 
you might in this study. You know what aha moments are. You're reading the Bible or you're listening to a message, you're in church, uh, you're in a Sunday school class, you're listening to something on the radio, and bingo, it hits you. And you said, I have heard that a thousand times, and it didn't even mean anything to me. And suddenly it was, aha. So the wisdom literature, specifically Proverbs, and Solomon told us, that if the wisdom literature, uh, uh, Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, the wisdom literature, Proverbs is the most important aspect of the wisdom literature. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So I'm going to give you an aha moment. So when you're 30 and 40, you really have no understanding of the Apostle Paul who said, though outwardly I waste away, inwardly I'm renewed day by day. You wake up at 60 and you get up out of bed and you can't move your neck. And then you have an aha moment. Though outwardly I'm wasting away. Inwardly I'm renewed day by day. When you're 31, you run like the wind. And you never get tired. And then one day, you run like hail, or not hell, hell, hail. Boy, that didn't come out right. You run like sleet. <laughs> and and it, it's like something's on you. You're burdened. But your inside says, I can still do it. And then you have an aha moment. And then you read the scriptures. And your whole life, if you're like me, you've been in the word since you're 17. And, and your whole life you've heard this. Oh, well, I'm wasting away into the new day by day. And it makes no sense. But boom, you have a revelation aha moment. Aha. Uh -huh. So Proverbs give us the spiritual fortitude to understand the revelations of God. And of spiritual understanding. So if the God of this world has blinded their eyes so they cannot understand the truth, there's no use talking to somebody who's a non-believer about spiritual things. Unless the Holy Spirit has talked to you about talking to them so that they could win their you could lead them to Jesus Christ the, Why because the spiritual uh, unspiritual cannot understand the spiritual And so that as you read the Proverbs on a continual basis and some most of you have heard this but I'm just going to say it anyway that um, I've been reading the proverb of the day since I was 31 Proverbs of the day so I've read every month all Proverbs every month since 31. I'm 64 and 11 months and one week. So that's 33 straight years plus. Even to this moment in time, you think, okay, you've read about all you can read, right? All of a sudden, you get a new revelation. You can read the same Bible moment over and over and over, year in, year out, year in, year out, and you think everything, and I've, I've studied it, and there can't be something new, and bingo, bam, it hits you. A revelation of God. That's the first step of the Proverbs. You read the Proverbs, and it, it opens your mind to the revelation of God and spiritual understanding. The second reason is to demonstrate wisdom in every relationship. In every relationship. To demonstrate wisdom in every relationship. Some of you, and I have been the same way, are involved in relationships, and I don't mean you're adulterers, I'm not talking about that. You're involved in relationships with people that add nothing to your life. They don't. They add nothing to it. See, there's, there's three kinds of people. Those that add to your life. Those that take away from your life. And those that do nothing for your life. They're like, like neutral. 
And Solomon says that the reading and the study of the, Prover- uh, the Proverbs is so that you demonstrate wisdom in the relationships that you have with people. So that you don't do stupid things. Nobody here ever does stupid things, but I do. So that it keeps you out of stupid moments. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Sometimes I think, you know, you guys look at me like, like, that's you, Pete, that's not me. I don't do stupid things. Oh, yes. But as, we, as you just ta- uh, tactfully go through the Proverbs day in and day out, day in, day out, and it just, it just saturates you. Now let me uh, give you a clue on memorizing scriptures. Some of you, I know Jeannie Stewart memorized the whole book of uh, uh, James one time. God bless you. <laughs> she said she was doing it. I said, I don't want to join you. Be warm and be fed. But people have asked me, Pastor Pete, how do you memorize scriptures? How do these scriptures come out of your mind? So let me give you a clue. Don't try to memorize scripture. Now, it's good. I mean, if God tells you to do something like James, I'm not criticizing Jeannie. I'm, uh, that's a, that deserves a standing ovation right there. But you don't try to memorize scripture. You read scripture like a novel, like a book, and it becomes part of your DNA. And then by becoming part of your DNA, the Bible says, the, Bi- the word God tells us that when you stand before people, do not worry because I will speak through you at the right time. And if you, but if you give nothing for God to use, you'll have nothing to use. So you just read it. You read the Proverbs every day. Then you read through the Bible on a yearly basis, and you do that year after year after year after year, and it doesn't hurt you. It takes between 15 and 20 minutes to read three chapters in the Old Testament, three chapters in the New, and the Proverbs every day. 15 to 20. Now you do that year after year after year, and pretty soon things become part of your DNA. And when you need scripture or when you think about scripture, suddenly you don't even know that you memorized it, and bingo, it comes up. Now I didn't come up with this. Some a wise man told me a long time ago, Pete, don't don't memorize scripture, just read scripture. Just place it in your mind on a continual basis every single day. And suddenly it will become life to you. It'll become alive. Now I'm not against memorizing. There are times when you just memorize, but is everybody understand what I'm saying? See, because the Proverbs are there, the Proverbs are there so that we can demonstrate the wisdom in the relationships that we have in many ways. But if we don't know the the wisdom, if we don't know the Proverbs, how can we demonstrate something we do not know? And the second part of it, to guide in choosing what is right and just and fair. To help you make choices that are right and just and and fair to help you make choices that are right and just and fair so you know that our whole life is choices our choices excuse me bad English our life what we do is constantly making choices you made a choice to come to here instead of do something else you made a choice to come here instead of watching TV you made the choice to come here Instead of watching a baseball game, if you like sports, you made a choice to come here instead of something else. So every day is a choice. You chose to eat at the taco truck or the burger hopping joint, whatever it's called. You chose to buy an ice cream or not to buy an ice cream. You've chosen to drink water or, as I look around, sodas. Okay? Or coffee. Or root beer. Or Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper, a good southerner. I don't know if you are. Are you from the south? Oh, you know, that's their drink of choice, the Dr. Pepper. It is. It's a southern drink. We won't go that way. But every day we make choices. Have you ever said, why did I choose that stupid thing? Yes. Perhaps there's a lack of wisdom that flows through your veins. And you make the choice. That is just. Who can tell me what just is? Who wants to try? Just. Pardon me? Something that follows the law? That's good. Something that's fair? 
honorable. There are choices that are honorable and law-abiding and fair. Boy, we're, we're already in the presidential season, right? Can I tell you what word you're going to hear so you're sick of it? Fair and balanced. We're already hearing it. One candidate was at Walmart today. You need to be fair. And yeah, I'm going to vote for you because people are fair. Nobody's fair. Nobody will be fair except the Lord. And the Lord wants us to truly be fair. Number three, to give youth the understanding of their design. Oh, oh. To give great skill and teach the immature and make them wise. So the immature can be 60, 70, 20, 15, 10. Okay, are you got it? So to give great skill and teach the immature and make them wise. That's what Solomon said. To make the immature wise. And we know this. I mean, have you ever heard in your... 52 you're acting just like a child no <laughs> 100 year old natalie works with 100 year olds <laughs> they're, they're immature that's cool <laughs> but to give great skill to do it it takes skill to teach people to be wise it takes skill you don't just get over there and 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 uh, john maxwell's famous for this he said there's there's leadership by permission and, and anybody can be a leader by permission. Okay? And there's leadership by your position. Okay? But true leadership is when you or I say, I allow you to lead me. And the Proverbs are there to help you to understand how to lead in the right way. How to lead in in the right way. Why do I have to do that? Because I'm your mother. Okay, that's position. All right. <laughs> but how to lead in the right way. How to lead young people and to teach the immature and make them wise. I don't think that age has anything to do with wisdom. No, I think wisdom has everything to do with wisdom. And promotion. Now we get to four. To give youth the understanding of their design and destiny. Now I teach this every week, whether you need, know it or not. I teach this every week. We all have a purpose. Have you ever heard me say that? God has a plan for you. You ever heard that? It, many times. And you're going to keep hearing it. Why? Because God has designed every one of us with a destiny. I wish I had another life. I do. Not because I don't want to go to heaven, not because I'm afraid of dying. Some guy accused me of that. You're afraid of dying. No, I'm not. If I go today, oh, well. I, I wanted to be smart, but I'm not going to. But I wish I had another life to see what the young people are going to do. How they're going to take this thing. And I believe this, that my grandkids, if you have grandkids, my grandkids, my daughters and son-laws kids, they might not get a driver's license. They might not ever learn how to drive a car. By the time they're their parents' age, it'll all be self-driving, if not flying. I believe that in 50 years, if I can make it, that's why I want to be 120 that we will have life on Mars. We will live on Mars. Not me. <laughs> they won't allow me. They won't allow anybody 100. You're staying down. We're going to waste money on you getting there. You might not make it. I mean, we can go on through the process of that, but all those who stood that were under 40, you have a destiny, and you can choose your destiny, or you can be regular. I'm not preaching at you. I'm telling you. You can choose a destiny, or you can be regular. And a long time ago, my wife and I made a choice. We're not going to be regular. 
no way, no how, no way. And I believe it came from the birth of reading the wisdom literature of Proverbs. Because look at it again. To give youth the understanding of their design. Do you know that the Bible says you know this because you've heard it from me? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Nobody here is fearfully and wonderfully made so you can goof around and do nothing. Can we agree with that? You are not fearfully and wonderfully made so you can just be regular. You're not fearfully and wonderfully. You are designed by the holy God. And the reason why God gave uh, Solomon the wisdom to write the Proverbs, he says it. When I'm going to show you all these things. We're going to go through every one of these in the Bible. But he says it because the youth need to have the design to know who they are and so they can accomplish the greatness that God has for him. No matter how great any of you may be right now, you are not great enough. God has more. So it is your choice, but you are here by design. You are here by choice to discover greatness so you can go farther. So you can do things that are beyond us old folks' thought processes. Beyond our mind. Beyond our wildest dreams. And finally, to break open your understanding break it open to see what others can't see to know what others can't know to hear what others can't hear and i mean with spiritual ears and spiritual eyes to unravel the deeper meaning of the parables to to get it to get the deeper meaning of the parables and we're going to go we're going to first go to the parable that jesus spoke in luke cha- uh, mark chapter four in a minute but to to, to break open the understanding and to unravel the deeper meaning of parables and to discern the enigmas, E-N-I-G-M-A-S, E-N-I-G-M-A-S, the enigmas of the wise. Have you ever noticed that intelligent people talk and you can't hardly understand them? Or people that use language that is bigger than the common man. And the word of God tells us that we have the capability through the understanding of the Proverbs to understand where these other folks live and how the other folks live and how we can get into the wisdom of the wise. Got it? That's the why. So I want you to, first of all, we'll go to Mark. Please turn your Bibles. Mark chapter 4. Tonight we're going to tear apart some Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1. But next week, we are going to dig, dig deep into Proverbs chapter 5. So we're going to go to Mark, first of all, chapter 4. Mark, the book of Mark in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, book number 2 in the New Testament. Chapter 4, please. Start with verse 1. Is everybody there? Okay. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. And the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat it out on the lake. So get in your mind. Imagine, imagine, and see Jesus out there. He's in a boat, and there's so many people. There's hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands. While all the people were along the shore of the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. And he said, listen. Whenever Jesus says, listen, he's better than E.F. Hutton. A farmer went out to sow seed. Some of you have heard this over and over again. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. The birds came and ate it up. And some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because it had no root. And other seed fell upon thorns which grew up and choked the plants so they did not bear grain. And other seed fell on the good soil. And it came up and it grew and it produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. And then Jesus said, he who has ears, everybody has ears. Yes. What is he saying? He that has a spiritual understanding, an understanding, we just said that, number five, to break open your understanding, to unravel deeper meaning of parables and discern enigmas of the wise. Then Jesus said, he who has ears, understanding, let him hear. Then he was alone, and the 12 others around him asked him about the parables. 
So they still didn't understand. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you in this Crosswinds building tonight. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. Go. So that. They may be ever hearing and seeing, but never perceiving. Ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they may turn and be forgiven. And this, this, this when I first read that, I've, it, many, many times I've read it a thousand times, honestly, maybe a thousand, maybe more. I, it was like, don't you want them to understand Jesus? Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? If you don't even understand this parable, can you see it? Most of the time this parable has been used about money. I've used it this by money, but I believe it has a lot more deeper meaning than money. Some people, and I'm going to now paraphrase with my own words. Some people are like seed along the path. Where the word is sown. They come to church. But as soon as the preacher starts. Something happens in their spirit. And they don't remember or even hear or understand. One word. And they say to themselves. That was boring. Here's the example. So some of us have gone to other uh, nations, and, and it, it is a privilege for all of us to one day go. You should, you should ask God to let you go. Make the time to go. So you go to Cuba, and I'll just use Cuba or to use any language. India was the same way. And nobody hardly ever speaks English because they don't know English. They're in a place where speaking English for the for the unlearned is is not a thing so you got to speak to them in spanish so you hear them sing in spanish you hear their church in spanish they preach in spanish they pray in spanish the only thing that we've got is preaching in tongues that's the only thing we have in common if it wasn't for speaking in tongues we have nothing in common and i can hear them and they get fired and the people are crying and, <laughs> and they're going on but here we're sitting here with nothing you hear nothing. You know everybody else is hearing. They're falling in the spirit. People are getting healed. There's miracles happening. And you're thinking, I don't even know what's going on. Now, that, that's an that's a easy example for this. You could be in this teaching moment right here. And it would be like we're speaking Spanish and you don't even speak a word of it. Does that make sense? Or you come to church and you you fought with your wife all the way or your husband and you get in and you look like a grump feel like a grump you go through mumbling of the songs if you even sing they pray the preacher preaches people get saved you go home and you have an hour and a half blur that is gone forever an hour and a half blur that's what Jesus is talking about. Some people are like seed on the path where the word is sown and preached and taught. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown to them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. And they get saved that Sunday. And they go home and they're so happy. But they never come back again. Because for some reason, they think that's good enough. And since they have no root, within a couple weeks, it's gone. And the joy they had at that very moment is gone. Perhaps never to ever experience it again as long as they live. Because when trouble, or maybe it's a wife, and when she goes home and tells her husband she got saved, and he crosses her out and criticizes her and tells her she's an idiot, she slinks back and it's easier to fall away than to fight that battle so she says what's the use still others 
like seed sown among thorns. Hear the word, but they're so worried that their paycheck didn't go along. It didn't go long enough, and they can't pay their bills. And the preacher said that God is a God of abundance, and he wants to give me favor. Doesn't seem like much favor to me. And the desires come in and say, wait a minute. I think a new car would make me happy. And I'm not funny here. You know what I need? Because I went to Costco. And I walked in the door and I said, my life would be complete if I had that TV. Or wait a minute. A new whatever. And suddenly the word becomes so minuscule because the things that disappear and rust take top precedence over understanding the parables and the enigmas of the power of the Holy Spirit. But others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word and it makes sense to them. And they understand it and it and it all of a sudden it clicks. They have the aha moment. There's a revelation. There's a spiritual understanding that hadn't been done, that hadn't been done before. And the deeper meaning suddenly comes thrill. It, it just it gets in my mind and I say, wait a minute, there's something that's so profitable for me, it'll change my life. But not only does it change my life, but it multiplies the blessing 30, sometimes 60, even a hundred times more than I ever believed possible. And then Jesus looked right at him and said, if you can't even understand this one, you got nothing. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1. Huh, thought I had plenty of time. We always finish on time. You know why? Because the kids' pastor will resign if we don't. <laughs> so the Proverbs of Solomon, everybody's on chapter 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and a prudent life, for giving prudence to the simple and knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning. For understanding proverbs and parables, saying and riddles of the wise, the enigmas. And here it is, church. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of this knowledge, but fools. So you're going to hear the word fool. So let's establish fool on the very first week. You're going to hear the word fool all through the proverbs. He constantly talks about the fool. So at least you think the fool is just some stupid idiot. No, the fool is not the court jester. The proverb fool is one who hears the word and believes that it is worthless and not worth my time. You got it? The proverb, as we read the proverbs, you're going to see this week after week. Now that you're on this on a daily basis, you're going to see the fool, the fool, the fool. The fool is the one who believes the word is worthless and not worth their time. So do you believe? I do. And you're lucky you're with a pastor that just says it like it is instead of beating around the bush. We know that our attendance, we know, is a minimum of 1,700. I believe that more than 1,000 on a weekly basis are biblical fools. Sorry. Why? What is the fool? One who hears the word and says it is not worth the time. And it has no use in me. I got to end on a high note. Let's see. <laughs> called sandwich preaching I always put the bread on there where everybody likes it oh that was good <laughs> okay but fools despise wisdom and discipline listen my son to your father's instruction do not forsake your mother's teaching 
for they will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. And now, my son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. And if they say, come along with us, let's lie and wait for someone's blood. Let's waylay some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with their plunder till you get caught and go to jail. Throw in your lot with us and we will share a common curse. Come on, my son. Don't go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. For their feet rush into sin, they're swift to shed blood. And how useless to spread a net in full view of all the birds. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They weigh only themselves, such is the end of all who go after ill gotten gain. It takes away the lives of those who get it. Wisdom calls aloud. Now, now here's the word of God is calling aloud. Jesus is calling aloud. The Holy Spirit is everywhere, calling aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of noisy streets, she cries out. The church music plays through the windows. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery? And here's the fool again. The fool is someone who what? Thinks what? Thinks that the knowledge has no use for them. They have no use for it. It's not good for them. What do I need that for? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? And if you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. But since you rejected me when I called, and no one gave heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. And I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when the disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me. They will open their Bible and say, oh, God, help me. But they will not find me since they hated knowledge when the time came and they did not choose to fear the Lord since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke. They will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes for the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But here it is. Whoever listens to me, church, will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. And with that, tonight we rest our case. Holy Spirit.